Um, it is now my great pleasure to introduce our luncheon speaker, who is also my friend for many years, Moises Naim, who is Senior Associate in the International Economics Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Moises is also the Chief International Columnist for daily newspapers El País and La República. Before joining the Carnegie Endowment, he was Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy Magazine. Previously, Dr. Naim was Minister of Trade and Industry of Venezuela and Director of Venezuela's Central Bank. He has also been Dean and Professor at the Instituto de Estudios Superiores de Administración, known as IESA, Venezuela's leading business school. Dr. Naim is a prolific writer and has written many scholarly articles and books, as many of you know, the latest being his just published book with the intriguing title, The End of Power, colon, From Boardrooms to Battlefields and Churches to States, Why Being in Charge Isn't What It Used to Be. Moises is, as you can tell from the title, is an insightful, provocative, and original thinker, and we are so pleased he is our featured speaker today. Please join me in welcoming Moises Naim. Thank you, Susan, and, and yes, we, we have been friends for many years, and it's a friendship that I, that I cherish. And thank you all for being here. Thank you to the center for the invitation. Um, I will try to be brief uh, in order to have as much time as possible to get your reactions, questions, comments. Uh, the book uh, essentially is about a big idea, and the big idea is that power is no longer what it used to be. Uh, that power is experiencing mutations and transformations uh, that are unprecedented, and that uh, the world uh, is, in fact, uh, changing as a result of that. The, that power is shifting is nothing new. We all know, and there is enough evidence around us, that power is shifting from uh, uh, west uh, to east, from north to south, from large companies to startups, from uh, presidential palaces to town squares, and, and even from uh, men to women. Uh, not as much as we think it should be, but that it too is beginning to happen. So, uh, but there's something else. That's not the only thing that is happening to power. Power is not just shifting, power is mutating. And more specifically, Power is decaying. What do I mean by that? That essentially power has become easier to get, harder to use, and easier to lose. It is now easier to challenge, displace, uh, constrain uh, the big established powers. Uh, and uh, once power is acquired, uh, it has far more constraints and limitations than it did in the past to the point in which it has become harder, uh, easier to lose. I argue, furthermore, that this is happening everywhere, in every country, in every space in the world, in every society. I also argue that this is happening in every aspect of organized human uh, activities. It is happening in governments and in the military. Uh, it's happening in churches and in labor unions in uh, big banks and startups, uh, in big philanthropies and criminal cartels. Uh, it's happening in science and it's happening at the universities. Every organized human activity is experiencing this mutation of power. So I know that these are bold assertions and I know that uh, inevitably they generate some, some dissonance, some cognitive dissonance, because they go against the grain of uh, some of the established narrative that we have now. As, as I was writing the book, this, it took me many years to write this book, I was aware and self-conscious of two things. Uh, first is that I was dealing with a subject that is big, complicated, and has been dealt with by some of the biggest thinkers uh, in, in humanity, and that is power. If you just uh, go around and look uh, for who has written about power and how much you have 
uh, a long, long uh, literature. So I was aware, and sometimes I felt like an idiot for trying to say something different and new about this subject. Uh, so it, it, I was very insecure uh, by having to deal with this big subject dealt by uh, some very important uh, thinkers. The second thing that made me very self-aware is that I knew that I was saying uh, that power was decaying at a time in which the general narrative is that power is concentrating, that we now have very large banks, and we have uh, the Googles and Facebooks of the world, and we have the Goldman Sachs and the JP Morgans, and we have the Chinese army and the Chinese uh, nation, um, and uh, of course the United States that continues to, to, to be that important. And we have Vladimir Putin that is concentrating power. And we had Hugo Chavez that stayed for 14 years uh, unassailed in, in his position. So if that is the dominant narrative, how could I argue the contrary? Uh, and so that was uh, also something that I had in, in mind. Um, and I decided that my only salvation uh, that the only thing I could do is to let the data speak. That rather than uh, having all sets of opinions and uh, anecdotes, I need to rely on data, on statistics, on evidence, on uh, facts that are not just my opinion, but are easily confirmable, uh, fact-checkable kind of assertions. And that's what the book is about. The book includes uh, chapters about all of these institutions, the military and national governments and geopolitics and the media and churches and labor unions and uh, uh, all of that. And in all of those, it, uh, I try to muster as much statistical evidence and as much uh, uh, data uh, as possible. Uh, from boardrooms to combat zones uh, to cyberspace, the, oh, for, in the media. The battles for power are as intense as ever. I'm not suggesting that uh, the competition is less. In fact, a central argument is that competition is more. But these fierce battles are yielding diminishing return because the fierceness of the battles masks the increasingly evanescent nature of power itself, its fragility, and the new multiple limits and constraints in how it can be wielded. And so that is the theme of the book, and that is the theme of uh, today's conversation. I will not bore you with a lot of data, but let me just pick randomly some examples to give you a flavor of the kind of evidence uh, that, uh, that it's out there. Take, for example, national politics. And there, there are two or three interesting factoids. In national politics, uh, you, if you trace uh, the, the, in electoral democracies where elections are fair uh, and free, and you look at what was the margin of victory of uh, the candidates that won the presidency or the becoming prime minister, you will see that over the years, uh, that margin has shrunk. And landslides, you know, governments that win with a strong mandate where a very large majority of society uh, supports uh, the, the candidate uh, still exist, but are very, very rare. What has become normal is to win election by a hair, by a very, very thin margin, without a clear mandate. And electorates constantly are sending the signal that they like divided governments and divided powers and divided uh, and fragmented uh, political uh, electoral outcomes. Today, in 30 out of the 34 wealthiest democracies in the world, uh, the prime minister or president uh, has to contend with an opposition parliament. So around the world, in only in four nations, the president or head of state is of the same political party as the, as the Congress that uh, imposes limits, constraints, uh, and checks and balances on, on its power. Um, the statistics are quite overwhelming in terms of uh, what are the, what's the evidence about what, what is happening. And then after, you, in elections, and then after you get to government, and become uh, the prime minister or the president, you discover that you are uh, like Gulliver uh, tied down by Lilliputians. 
thousands of uh, uh, actors that limit your ability to do things, from independent central bankers to independent local, state and local uh, governments, from uh, hedge funds to um, interest groups to 24 media, and media that scrutinizes far more, uh, to all kinds of actors that are now uh, limited in very important, w limiting in very important ways. There is a fascinating uh, small example that I, I found very interesting. Just before the, the recent election in the United States, President Obama gave an interview uh, he and, uh, to Michael Lewis, who is a very good journalist. And uh, they were talking uh, in the White House in the residence. And they were talking about uh, the presidency. And uh, President Obama just says, look out. L look out outside this window. You see there is a patio there. That patio was built by Ronald Reagan. And no one said anything. Do you imagine me deciding to build a patio in the White House? It will paralyze the government for, a, for, for months because there will be a, a debate and there will be all kinds of uh, activities and, and resistance. Imagine, imagine talk radio for days on end discussing how I am wasting taxpayers' money is in, in building a, a, a patio. And so it, it, may, it may sound like a, a trivial example, but I think it's one of those small examples that has uh, large um, reverberations. Uh, think, uh, well, and then what is happening around, and this is not an American example only, um, you can see around the world uh, the effect that has on governing, you know, activist judges uh, are now becoming very important everywhere, the, the judicial, uh, judges that take decisions that are, that are used to be outside of their realm and used to be part of the legislative or the executive power are now uh, very much at the center of things. Uh, as I said, uh, mayors and governors and state local authorities. Uh, and, uh, and in general, we see the end of uh, uh, the situation sequester in the United States. You know, they, they, it's a very powerful example of uh, governments that, that have a very hard time making decisions. The elections in Italy, elections that do not yield a government. This is the only place in the world where you have an election and instead of the election generating a government, they generate more gridlock. Um, and Italy has always been a bit dysfunctional in this way, but I think Italy exemplifies some of the global trends that I am um, um, discussing. Uh, there are, uh, well, and, and this, I, I can go on, but, but another example is in the military. Uh, what is becoming very clear is that big, big budgets do not buy uh, guaranteed national uh, security. Uh, it's becoming clear, it's becoming very interesting to see how l small bands of insurgents, uh, small groups uh, of fighters, of combatants that, that fight with very different rules of engagement uh, and with very different weapons uh, are capable not of winning over these largest armies in the world, but uh, are capable of denying them victory. Uh, what is happening with the Taliban or what is happening in, in Afghanistan and, uh, and Pakistan, what is happening uh, with the Somali pirates. Uh, here we have a, a group of former fishermen uh, that have these rickety boats that use outboard borders and Kalashnikovs, old Kalashnikovs and, and rocket propelled grenades. They go out in the sea and they are capable of hijacking the biggest ships in the world. And they have been doing this now for a, a long while and for ransom, they, they just get millions of dollars every year in exchange for releasing uh, the big ships. And the world has reacted to this. And the world reacted by deploying one of the most sophisticated ar uh, armadas, uh, fleets, uh, ever. Uh, and the NATO is there, and the Russians, and the Chinese, the Ukrainians, uh, everyone has uh, very advanced ships, battleships, plying the waters of the F Gulf of Aden. But the pirates still continue to hijack the big, the big ships. They have not been able to stop them. So, I'm not suggesting that uh, people in, in, with, with, in these boats are going to defeat this army, uh, this, 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 this fleet, but I am certainly, it's obvious that they're denying them victory. 
There is a very interesting statistic. There is a study uh, by a Harvard scholar called Ivana Regin Tofts. He decided to look into asymmetric wars. Wars where uh, the weak, uh, the wars between a weak side in terms of uh, number of uh, troops and, and, and quality of the weapons and other resources was fighting a stronger uh, enemy. Between 1850 to 1949, the weak side in asymmetric wars won 12% of the time. So as expected, the big army won most of the time. Then he looked at the same at the wars between 1950 and 1998. Between 1950 and 1998, the weak side won 55% of the time. So it became more frequent that the weak side would win uh, than it was ever that, 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 than before. Uh, and we can see also all kinds of, of examples in the military realm. And then there is business. In, in the case of business, there is also uh, very interesting statistics and very strong evidence that it's becoming more slippery at the top, which is, again, something that runs against the grain uh, when one thinks Carlos Slim or Bill Gates or uh, Warren Buffett. You know, the, the idea that we have these huge fortunes uh, that are at the top uh, and, uh, and very hard to dislodge, you know, the idea that uh, the, the top of, uh, uh, of the business world is now more slippery. Uh, it's, uh, of course, counterintuitive, but the statistics show that that's the case. So there is an econometric study that uh, estimated what, what is the probability that a company in the 20%, uh, in the top 20% of its sector, will still be in that category five years hence. That, that uh, uh, probability that of not being there doubled in the last 20 years. So the probability that you'll be ousted of the top tier is now twice what it used to be. The probability that a company would have a brand damaging accident, a reputational accident that will lower uh, the value of the company has gone from 20% in the early 90s to 82% now. And there are some very interesting examples. When in 1989, the Exxon Valdez, of course, had an accident in, in Alaska and, and had the big uh, oil spill. Uh, at the time, the shares of uh, Exxon, the owner of, of the ship, went down uh, by 3% in four months as a result of this. Uh, fast forward to 2010, uh, and, and you had the uh, the accident in the Gulf of Mexico with British Petroleum, when that happened, the shares of British Petroleum went down 14% in seven days. So that gives you a sense of the speed and the sense of uh, the kind of things that are, that, that are happening. And I have other examples in, in the case of uh, the, the religion. It is quite outstanding, uh, uh, amazing. Uh, what's happening to uh, the reconfiguration of market shares for souls around the world. Uh, um, in Latin America uh, and Africa, for many years, in many countries, they used to be mostly Catholic. Um, in, the, the, in, in Brazil, the census of 1970, uh, according to that census, 90% of Brazilians called themselves Catholics. Uh, in the census of 2010, only 60% uh, did that. Uh, said that. Uh, the same is happening uh, in Africa, the same is happening. There are a bunch of new religions and new forms uh, of Christianity that are now competing. And, uh, and uh, evangelicals and, uh, and Episcopalians and uh, Pentecostalists are now uh, pre present uh, in places that were once uh, the complete um, hegemony of um, Roman Catholic Catholicism. And the same is happening in the labor sector and all that. Why? Why, why is this decay of power happening? Uh, the typical answer, the typical instinct, is to say, well, it's because of the internet. It's, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's Google, and it's social media, and it's Facebook, and it's Twitter, and that explains it. Well, and I disagree deeply with that view, um, because I think that the, those are tools and tools need users, and users have direction and motivation that are driven by other factors. 
So yes, the, 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 the social media has opened new opportunities, but the users are using these opportunities in a, in a direction and in a, a, in, with a motivation that is, has nothing to do with the internet. It's driven by other factors. It's driven by tectonic changes in the way the world is structured, in its uh, demography, in its economy, in its society, and it's in international configuration. Uh, and there is a long list of factors uh, that drive that. I, es essentially, what I argue that is happening is that the powerful have uh, barriers that protect them and guarantee their power. These barriers are, can be of a multiplicity of uh, kinds, it can be of many kinds, and can either be property rights, exclusive property rights to a technology or a, some, 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 some unique assets that, that provide special um, advantages. Uh, it can be a technology, it can be the capacity to uh, deploy, the, to use violence, uh, it can be uh, uh, tradition. Uh, history, et cetera. Well, each one of those barriers that is protecting the powerful is now uh, less protective and easier to uh, overwhelm, circumvent, or undermine. And, uh, and the factors that are making these barriers less protective are many, and I group in, in three categories that I call three revolutions that the world is experiencing. The first one is the more revolution, we essentially have more of everything. Uh, we have more countries and more political parties and more medicines and more weapons and more computers and more, and more people uh, and uh, more of everything. And it's, uh, that has consequences for power and I can explain how, but it's rather obvious. Um, and the second, the second revolution I call the mobility revolution. And that is not only we have more of everything, but that more moves more. Uh, goods and services and people and money and ideas and pandemics and financial crisis and everything. Everything moves far, far more and it's much harder to, to, to contain. And together these two generate the, three, the third revolution, which is a revolution in mentality, in mindsets. Uh, changes in values, changes in expectations, aspirations, uh, ways of doing things, uh, tolerance for certain things that were done certain ways forever and have to be done that way because that's the way we do it. You know, that approach is rapidly eroding around the world. Um, one of the most trenchant examples, I think, uh, that I found is, uh, of this change in, in mentality is uh, divorce rates in India. Uh, among the elderly. It turns out that uh, the rates of divorce among seniors in, in India are soaring, initiated by the women. And these are, of course, arranged marriages. You know, if you're, if you're talking about people that are 60, 70 years old, um, they were forced into, or, you know, they were into arranged marriages. Um, and the women are now leaving those marriages. They are up to here of taking care of the old guy and, and, and moving, moving away. <laughs> and, uh, and why? Why now? Uh, well, for, for the other, there is more, there are more revolution has to do this, where the mobility revolution has to do this, but essentially they have been empowered. They now can do it, they know it, they can do it, and uh, it has uh, all sorts of uh, uh, ramifications. Uh, and this is not just anecdotal. Uh, there, there is uh, all kinds of surveys and, 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 and evidence that shows that the world is moving in a direction uh, that uh, is uh, transforming traditional expectations and aspirations and values. Uh, the World Values Survey is a, is a project at the University of Michigan that was started 30, 40 years ago in which they tracked values around the world. They had a bunch of countries uh, to which they went and asked uh, every year the same question about values and how people saw things. And uh, if you look at the way the charts of these results is quite outstanding uh, in terms of uh, very dramatic changes in mentality. So the more revolution overwhelms the barriers that protected the powerful, the mobility revolution helps challengers circumvent the barriers and the mentality revolution helps the challengers undermine the barriers. 
put them together, shake them, and you have very insecure power centers. Um, there are two questions that are, of course, uh, derived from this conversation. Uh, one, is this good or bad? Uh, the, the big, so what? And the uh, other is what to do? What to do with this, either to take advantage of these trends um, uh, or, or not? Uh, and uh, let me just say that uh, the, the, the good or bad is that, uh, of course, it's, uh, there's plenty to celebrate about these trends. There's plenty to welcome. These, uh, these are trends that are opening opportunities and possibilities and uh, are creating inclusion opportunities for groups that have always been excluded. Um, and, uh, and from young startups uh, and young entrepreneurs uh, to people that are more able to move to women that are able to, do, to have options that they didn't have before, there's a world of opportunity that is worth celebrating for voters and citizens and consumers and activists and intellectuals, professors, everyone, uh, politicians. So there is a lot to celebrate, but there is a downside to this, and that is that in the world of politics, uh, the decay of power and the fragmentation of power is, of course, creating governments that are very, very increasingly incapable of delivering results. You have an increasing presence of what uh, Frank Fukuyama has labeled, has, he coined a term called vitocracy, vitocracies which are democracies where veto centers are proliferating. Uh, these are political systems in which uh, everyone, every small group, seems to have just enough power to block the initiatives of uh, others, and no one has enough power to move and push forward uh, initiatives, uh, programs, agendas, uh, platforms. Um, and the world is now full of those. Uh, countries in which paralysis and the inability to make decisions that are timely, that are effective, that are not diluted, that are not watered down to satisfy everyone and therefore are highly ineffective, that's becoming very, very common. And that has consequences not only for uh, decision making at the local, national level, but it has global consequences. Uh, the list of uh, um, problems that no country can tackle alone is growing. Globalization and other dynamics uh, is uh, increasing uh, the number of threats and problems that the humanity needs to tackle and solve or alleviate and that no country can do it alone, not even a superpower. So countries need to work together to solve some of these problems. And increasingly, the governments and the nations are finding great difficulty uh, of uh, finding ways of working together effectively. When was the last time that you heard that a very large number of nations got together and made a decision that was really transformative about the world? Probably it had to do with the Millennium Development Goals in, in 2000. But after that, every time that there is a summit about climate change or there is a summit about nuclear proliferation or some of the problems in the list of threats, uh, the results are always uh, tend to be disappointing. Uh, and therein lies uh, one of the, the downsides to these trends that I'm describing uh, and, uh, and, and, and have consequences uh, for, uh, for the way we live and the way uh, we look uh, at the world. Let me finish with some uh, very specific points about Latin America, what it all means for Latin America uh, in terms of uh, what are the implications of these trends. First, please note that Latin America is one of the regions uh, where it is most frequent for presidents not to be able to finish their term. We have a long list, just uh, you know, and think from the early 90s to today and do the list of countries where at some point, uh, you know, presidents couldn't govern. Um, and, uh, and then uh, that, uh, that created, a, this is an idea that Javier Corrales has developed. Uh, then that creates a pendulum in which the population then wants a strong government. So let's bring Fujimori and give him a lot of power. Uh, after, you know, uh, the, uh, in Venezuela, let's, let's bring Chavez and give him a lot of power, um, and, and so on. So there is this pendulum uh, that, um, that, that 
creates all, all kinds of complications. Uh, but not only there is a, a growing appetite for governments that get things done, but there is also, um, that nurtures an appetite. The, the notion of looking at governments and political parties that don't work create uh, an endless appetite for the proverbial honest leader. The leader that uh, will bring us forward, that may be uh, a little bit heavy handed in certain things, but is honest. So, and corruption is a very important issue. Of course, as we discussed this morning in, in, in many instances, corruption in Latin America is an issue as it is er everywhere else. And the way in which we are fighting the war in corruption is in effect uh, weakening democracies and is also um, helping the most corrupt elements in societies. Because the essential way in which our countries fight for corruption, against corruption is uh, searching for the proverbial honest leader. A messianic-like leader that is honest, that will not steal, and that uh, he's the one. And that propensity in the world that has brought to power uh, Putin, Berlusconi, and Chavez that uh, all of them uh, uh, had that, that platform. All of them were, uh, in many ways, uh, their ascent to power is fueled by the need to stop corruption and fight this leader uh, that will not allow this, uh, the stealing to continue. And Latin America continues to be in, in the search for, for that. Uh, um, and, and that doesn't leave a lot of space to do the changes in the institutions and the rules of the game that uh, don't uh, have to rely on the honesty of the leaders, but on a system um, that makes sure that stealing is risky and finding, discovering that you stole has consequences. And, is, and you know, fighting impunity uh, and lowering the incentives uh, for, for, for corruption uh, is far more important than the chase for uh, the leader. Uh, the honest leader. And finally, in Latin America, of course, uh, uh, we have seen in a fascinating way what is happening with the re-election. So it's not only a continent where a lot of presidents don't end mandates, their period, but it's also the continent where they extend their period through constitutional change, changes. And we have seen it, Fernando Enrique Cardoso was able to change the rules so he could rule to, uh, to two terms. Um, the same happened uh, with Menem, the same happened with Fujimori, the same was attempted uh, by President Uribe, and he did it once, but then the third time it didn't work, and that's the operational reality. They get to do it for a little while, twice, but the third time almost always is blocked, except in Venezuela under Chavez. But normally presidents have a hard time leaving office, but also have a hard time staying in office. Thank you. <laughs>